I think putting ourselves in these separate worlds of what medium we're using maybe isn't so helpful. Like I spend a lot of time now looking at things that aren't ceramics and it's a lot more helpful in my creative process and like hanging out with painters and talking to painters and looking at paintings and um, different art forms than just ceramics. Cause I think we can get very myopic in what we do. And I think important to see ceramics in the context of art and other mediums. Hi, I'm Bob Acton, and I'm pleased to share my conversation with potter and author Melissa Weiss with you. She is a studio potter located in Asheville, North Carolina, in the United States. Melissa digs her own clay out of her own land in northwest Arkansas. She turns this clay into a slip and screens the big rocks out, and then adds some dry clays, feldspar, and sand. She uses a variety of methods to make her pots, including wheels, pinched, and slab constructed. We spent this great session talking about her journey in clay, her work, and her use of color in surface design. I hope you enjoy this episode, as I really enjoyed my conversation with Melissa. You can find out about how to reach Melissa and where to find her book in the show notes. And the show can always be found at colorandceramics.com. Thanks for joining us in your creative journey. Welcome to Color and Ceramics, the podcast for ceramic artists who want valuable ideas about using color from leading artists and world-class experts. Here's your host, Bob Acton, a sculptor and ceramic artist who's fascinated with color and how potters, sculptors, and artists use color in their work. Tune in as he talks with his guests about color, techniques, and the impact of color on people and art itself. Melissa, welcome to the Color and Ceramics podcast to talk about color and surface decoration. Um, Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, you're most welcome. You know, I really love the deep colors on your work. And and although this is an audio podcast, um, I'm watching you actually prepare some surfaces as we're having this conversation. So that's pretty mm-hmm. cool. Um, I, I, you know, I really like the shapes on your pieces because they have such a, a bright energy to them. And of course, I'm a dog guy myself, so I like <laughs> your dog images, but I bet you the cat people love the cats. Um, um, I hope I don't disappoint you when I tell you they're not dogs, they're horses. <laughs> are they? Oh, no. <laughs> but I well, think they're left to interpretation because they're uh, not realistic, so uh, it's fine. Okay, that's good. I did see some that I thought were horses and some that I thought were (laughs) dogs. Um, uh, So I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you about your work and your ideas and how you work on with color and surface. Uh, But you know, uh, you know, I followed you for a long time and, and uh, with your great work that you do really represents probably years of hard work. And so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your journey, kind of what got you here today. Okay. Um, Well, I didn't discover ceramics until I was almost 30 years old. I hadn't ever had ceramics in school as a kid, so I'd never, ever, ever made anything out of clay. And I had a baby, and it was really, you know, hard, stressful. So I took a ceramics class and really liked it. And it was a nice way to take a break. Um, And then I moved to Asheville a year later, and my baby was one and I took another class at the community college and liked it, but wanted more access to studio time. So started taking classes at a community studio where I had access to open studio hours. And just the more I did it, the more I wanted to do it. And I just loved how limitless it was and how you could explore the medium and then I quickly realized I wanted my own studio because I wanted more space and I wanted to be able to experiment a little bit more so I moved into a communal studio and then I started 
working with some local potters and learning how to wood fire and make glazes. And I just kind of gave myself uh, or kind of worked through an education with local people and some studios. But really, it was just making. I made a lot of pots and did a lot of experimenting um, and just kind of figured out what worked, what didn't. And and then just went from there. I never thought it would be my job. I was doing it whenever I could, but I had a full-time job and I worked in restaurants and bars. And then I was with my kid the rest of the time. So when she was in school, I was in this pottery studio a little bit more. And then eventually it just became what I did full time. But it was, that was, that was eight years ago. So this was, and, and I started making pots 18 years ago. So for the first decade, I, I, I had another job. And for the last eight years, this has been my only job. Well, we're lucky that you're uh, giving it your full all now. That's awesome. I guess I, you know, I did a little bit of research before we, uh, had this conversation, and one of the things that you talk about is how your family life uh, growing up has uh, is reflected in the work that you are doing now. That you want to keep it alive, if I have got that correct. And and so I wondered um, what continues to motivate you today. What uh, what excites you about the clay that you're working with? Um, so in regards to, yeah, in my family, I'm the only person that makes things in my family, just like a lot of artists, like the true black sheep of the one that was always doing something different. And we didn't have any artists in my family and nobody in my family even like had handmade things or, uh, we never went to museums. Um, but my grandmother, yeah, she, she was an amazing cook and she is Sicilian. So she would make amazing Sicilian meals every Sunday for the whole family. And I never put it together until I started making pots, but it just made so much sense because I, that ritual and that had such an impact on me. So looking back on it and so happy I had that experience as a kid. And so I often think of how important traditions are and then being able to collaborate with, with things like that. Like even now I feel like I'm collaborating with her by just making dishes that mm-hmm. people are serving food on for their families. And I love thinking about that because she died when I was only 14. So, um, but now what, what motivates me? I mean, part of it is escapism when, I get a little overwhelmed with everything. I have this place where I can be lost in my own world, decorating and making pots, which is, which is just, uh, I I guess it's, it just feels like a meditation and sometimes Mm -hmm. or a way to like really work out ideas. So I'm either like kind of escaping and not thinking about the world or listening to podcasts and books and like really thinking about the world that goes either Mm -hmm. way, but both, both, this is a nice environment for both. And these days I'm looking at a lot of books, historical books on, and I have since last summer on like Greek, Roman and Arab worlds and the imagery and thinking a lot now about Palestine and what's happening. And I think that stuff just comes out when you make art in ways that you don't even anticipate all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was I was talking with somebody else the other day, and he was talking about how the ideas come out in him, and he's not even sure where they come from sometimes. But when he really looks at it, it's been something he visited or a place he visited years ago. So... I understand that. Yeah, for sure. Oh, absolutely. I love the subconscious nature of how things just sit in until they're ready to come out. And you're like, you don't even, yeah, you don't even always know where it's from, but it's something that you have experienced. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know that you uh, dig your own clay. So um, 
maybe you could tell people a bit about that because probably most people don't do that. Most people, at least most people that I know, go to the store and buy their clay. And and so you could tell, can you tell us a little bit about that and how that affects what you do and how you think about your work? Sure. Um, okay, so when I was using store-bought clay for the first couple of years I was making clay, but then people in my area, there was a few people in my area that were using some wild clays and making custom clay bodies. And I was really immediately just blown away and enamored by that experience. Cause I guess I didn't really think about it. I didn't really think that like the clay in the bag was the same clay that could come out of the ground. It like, yeah, I just had never thought about it. And I was like, Oh, of course. Um, and I went back, I have some land in Arkansas that I bought with friends before I was a potter. Um, and I went back there to visit and realized the ground was all this red clay. Mm -hmm. And so I took a bucket back to Asheville and spent, I did not know what I was doing at all. I asked questions and my friend, Sean Ireland had a recipe for his clay body. So I kind of went off that recipe and plugged my wild clay in where his was and looked at some books and asked questions and kind of would make like different variations and then change it. I, I, I honestly think the only reason I was successful is 100% luck and the fact that I didn't know anything because I didn't really know like all the stuff that could go wrong. And I was more just like, what could go wrong? And um, <laughs> it turns out everything and nothing did. I just got lucky. So when I got to a point where it was a clay body of the, I wanted to be able to throw with it, but also hand build with it. Even though I wasn't yeah. hand building too much back then, I was doing some slab work and I wanted a clay, but I had to make sure it was vitrified at the temperature I wanted to fire to, which was cone 10 and that my glazes I was using would fit. And that I, my, my biggest thing was that it was durable because a lot of the people I knew using some local clays, the pots were beautiful, but they were not super strong. Mm -hmm. Like not like dishware that you could like kind of treat like a little bit rough, throw them, throw around a little bit. It was like very chippy mm -hmm. and I'm not the most graceful person. And I didn't want to worry about breaking dishes all the time. And also I didn't want to put functional dishes out in the world that were prone to chipping. So my clay body is really strong and that was really important to me. So I came up with a recipe after a few months of testing different variations of ingredients and I've been using it ever since. And that was almost the whole time I've been working with clay. I've been using this custom stoneware that I made. So once a year I go to Arkansas and with my husband and we dig clay, we dig 2000 pounds and since that clay I dig is 25% of the final recipe, it'll make 8,000 pounds throughout the year. And we make it in 1,000 pound batches. Um, I don't think I go through 8,000 pounds anymore. I make a lot less pots than I used to. But that used to be how much I would go through for like the period of years where I was doing a lot of shows and really acting like a maniac that had a body that would last forever. <laughs> That's a lot of clay. It was too much, but I don't work at that pace anymore, and it's a lot better. Yeah, yeah, cool. Now, did the clay itself, the color of the clay, I assume, um, affect your choices of colors on your pieces? Um, well, yeah. So the clay I use is a very iron rich. So the clay body is like very, very red and very dark. Now I reduction cool my pots, so the clay body goes black. But either way, it's it um, is very dark. So I started using this ash glaze a long time ago, and it looked really good on the clay. Like when I was first developing the clay, I wasn't really thinking about that because I didn't really know enough. And I had some glazes I was using that looked good on the clay. But then I started experimenting with slips, and that mm -hmm. would brighten up some of the glazes. Mm -hmm. Um. So it was a nice, it, it's a rich clay body and the iron comes through. So it, it needs like a either slip between a glaze or a really opaque glaze. But I was never interested in totally covering up the clay body because I spend so much time 
digging and processing this clay because it's beautiful. So I don't want to like totally coat it in a glaze where it doesn't come through. So the glazes I use are opaque enough to decorate and have it be bright, but not so opaque that the aesthetics of the clay body aren't coming through. So mm -hmm. I kind of look at it all as like little like, layers that you can see through to the next to the inner layer so it's like the clay body and then if i'm using slip it's thin you can see and then a glaze so you can see the slip through the glaze and the clay through the slip yeah cool and, yeah yeah and uh your your work uh has a lot of rich colors in it is are those colors uh using slip or are those a glaze that you use on top of the slip um, so most of my colors are under glaze. Um, so a lot of ceramics that I've learned, I guess, maybe over the years, just like really loving experimenting, but also figuring out that most of the rules or the things people say you can't do in ceramics are, I would try because I'd be like, you know, you want to know, like, for yourself why you can't do it yeah. and most of those rules actually turned out not to be real so now i don't believe anything anybody says about what things you can't do in ceramics but one of the things <laughs> that was the most exciting is the use of under glazes and maybe it's not so much they say you can't use under glazes on top of glaze but the fact that they're called under glazes I never really thought about them. I always considered them uh, like a low fire electric killed material that you mm -hmm. used under glaze. But one day when I wanted to start experimenting with color, I, a studio mate of mine had some turquoise on, under glaze and I tried it. I just like did what I normally did, but instead of using the iron oxide, I used that and fired it and it was beautiful and bright. And I was completely shocked. I just kind of thought all the color would fade out and it wouldn't be anything. So then I started experimenting with more underglazes and some don't work, but a lot do. And that kind of led me to just do more decorating on the pots because I had just more materials to use to decorate. Yeah. And that's one aspect. I also use mason stains in a lot of... Oh, so I have a white chino that I use a lot and I make white chino and then I'll take some out and like add mason stains. So it's basically the same base glaze mm -hmm. and then I can color them and then you can layer the chinos together. And then I do some things like I'll, I've made some low fire, very low fire glazes with, with, um, cobalt. And then I have a green and they're low fire, but I can use them on top of the glaze in the high fire if I use them as decorating. They like drip a little bit, which is nice. Yeah. So just kind of trying to do a bunch of things that you're not really supposed to do to see what happens. And I've so it's a combination, I guess, of oxides, glazes, and under glazes. I've just I've, I haven't really messed around with colored slips. So it's it not I, like I don't use that. Yeah, it sounds like one of the things that's important to you is to be able to experiment and try stuff, right? Oh, 100%. I almost always have something experimental in every kiln. And that's like the thing I'm always most excited about to open the kiln and see. I yeah. have a bunch of gla glazes going in my next kiln to experiment, but that's one of the reasons why I've never been bored with ceramics and why I think it's so interesting is because the experimenting is limitless yeah do you have a specific color palette that you use or that you like to use for any particular reason or is it just what uh, comes to mind um i do have very strong feelings about colors about but it's more about like what colors i don't like i i never really thought about it before i guess but i guess i really don't like the color of purple because I don't use it at all and I have no interest in it, but I think I'm more interested in like color combinations mm. and that's really fun to me. I do a lot of drawing at home with like colored pencils and crayons to work out like color combinations or like color studies. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that's, I think that's the most interesting part is like putting colors together that I think work really well together. Yeah. And that you said you do at home you know, with some practice. Yeah, I really like to draw and do that kind of stuff. But I'll, so I'll do that to like work out some colors, but also the, it's nice to do it directly on the pots too and just see, because even if you do it on 2D, it's not always the same. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And of course, once you get it in the kiln, you never know what sometimes it's going to come out like. So uh, you got to try it there too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How, how, how do you balance the use of color with other elements of design, like form or texture in your work? Yeah, that's a good question. I think about that all the time. And I think about how important it is to experiment and change things because what that does is it puts you on a new direction or path and it ends up changing the way you think about all of the aspects of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So that's been like something I've noticed when I started reduction cooling it led me to like use different glazes. And when I was using different glazes, that lends me to different forms. And when I, when you have different forms, it lends to different decoration. So everything kind of, you change one tiny thing and you kind of never know what's going to happen because you start following this thread of change and it leads to so many more exciting just so many more doors open up mm -hmm. so now because because i decorate so much more than i used to and make more narrative pots i'm thinking about that when i'm making so i think a lot about like the planes of like say a plate where the bottom could be like the main like scene and then like the sides of the plate are like a different plane to decorate and then like the rim so it's changed how i make forms because I want different planes to decorate on. And that's been really fun and interesting. So then they kind of start playing off of each other and you start thinking about the decorating process when you're making pots. And when you're decorating, you start thinking about the making yeah. and what you might do next time. So you can fulfill this decorating dream in the way that you have in your head. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. And, and I guess the thing that you also talk about is that you're always experimenting, always changing, that it's not some static thing that you're making the same shape and the same color and the same design over and over and over. Oh, I would have never made it this long in ceramics if I made the same thing over and over. I yeah. had like a little, a little ego meltdown when I was making, <laughs> I was making black and white pots for years and they were selling and it was successful. But I was so bored and just creatively stunted and didn't even realize it until yeah. one day I knew it was bad when I opened a kiln and it was a, in quote, successful firing. Like everything came out how I wanted, but there was like nothing exciting or new happening. And I just like panicked. I was like, is this it for me? Am I going to be one of those people that just like is creatively dead, but just making the same thing forever? <laughs> and I, I like had to totally like flip it on its head. And that's when I started experimenting with color and just like really wanting to, to not make pots that were predictable to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you experiment, do you experiment in, um, in a way like, uh, I remember, uh, I was a psychologist for many years and one of my teachers talked with me about, how to do experiments where you would change one variable and then you would change another variable. And so you would do things rather slowly, but very methodically. Is that the approach that you take to experimenting with color or surface? Oh, I love that in this application because it's true, but I'm always fighting it because I'm impatient and I want to, I want to make a thing and I want to like see what happens now but this is a very funny moment in time because that's how it's been. I have a big gas kiln. So when I want to make a new glaze or test something, I have to wait until I fill the whole kiln, which takes about a three weeks to a month. So I work for a month. Well, it used to take three weeks to a month. Now it's like four to six weeks. So I make fire the kiln, get this test back. And then, you know, in ceramics, you make 
a test, a small test of something, but you get some information, but it's not enough information to go for it. I mean, we've all done that, I think, yeah. just went yeah. for it and bad things can happen because <laughs> one little test, it either yeah. could be an anomaly or it just wasn't enough information. So then I would have to further up with an additional test and then that's four to six weeks yeah. to see that process through. And then who knows, you might have to tweak on that for a while. But by the time you get to use something that you're testing, sometimes it can be six months six or months. more. Yeah. And that was hard for me because I want to be faster in my tests. I want to be able to like move through things and do new exciting things all the time. So recently I found, and I still can't believe we found this because I live in an area where there's a lot of potters. So whenever there's a used equipment, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of competition for it, but we found a very small gas kiln on Craigslist. It's like the thing I didn't know I needed. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's small. It'll probably it probably would hold like 50 mugs. I can't remember the interior square footage, but it's going to change everything. Like I'm going to be able to put a test in there and then a week later do it again or like two weeks later, I guess. So instead of six months, I might be able to start realizing things in like four to six weeks, which Mm -hmm. that could be my kryptonite where I don't make pots anymore and I just go down the (laughs) rabbit hole of testing forever, but I think it's going to be a good thing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You got to have those little tests over and over. And so I guess what you're talking about is also having patience, right? You need to be able to be excited about things and want to move forward, but also have some patience to be able to get through that. I know. I think it's pretty ironic that ceramics is what I ended up with because when I think about it, I'm a pretty impatient person. And it's funny to have found myself in a medium where you can't do this work. It it is all about patience. So I've been forced by the universe to learn how to be patient, even though I still don't love it. Yeah. I know when I go down into my studio often, I say to myself, okay, Bob, just today, let's be patient. And so, uh, (laughs) so, so I know what you mean. I was going to ask you about whether you had a challenge in your work and what you did to overcome that. But I wonder if having patience is one of the challenges that you uh, (laughs) you had. Um, Yeah, I guess, I I guess it didn't, I didn't really know I needed patience to do this. I just like, at first I was, it just, everything's so slow, but I think part of like making the clay is I'm involved in the whole process. Mm -hmm. So that's been kind of nice because if I, there's so many steps to what I do that like you can kind of ignore the fact that like you don't get to see the finished pot for so long because you're so immersed in each step. So it's like the clay step and then the making of it and then the decorating and then the firing. So it's not like you're just sitting around waiting. You're, And that's, I think like what's so important about like really loving every part of the process is that has made me patient because I'm not, I am, you know, impatient to see results in a way, but like, since I'm enjoying all the steps to get there, it doesn't feel like, you know, waiting online or something like that. Hey, um, but I I was going to ask you, you know, I look at your work and I see that some of your work has a message in it. And I, and I wondered whether, you feel like the colors that you choose to use influence the overall mood or the message of your work. What's the message? Well, I, I've seen some things recently about Palestine, for example. Oh, you mean like specific message? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, sure. Uh, I guess there are some things that are more specific the colors i mean when it comes to the some of the stuff by palestine i was yes the colors were significant because they were the colors of the flag um and things like that but i think color itself is a message like palettes i mean even if it's not a direct spell it out for you message color evokes feelings and I think color is very personal and so it would mean something different to everybody, but it's still a message. It's a message rooted in feeling. 
which I'm putting my feelings onto these pots, but somebody else is going to be projecting there. So yeah. that's kind of what I like about using color is how adaptable it is and how people are going to get different meanings from mm -hmm. the work that I'm putting out there. Mm -hmm. I talked to one potter who feels that there's always one mug or one piece at each show that doesn't sell, that people pick it up and look at it and think about it and then put it down. And when finally somebody buys it, she always goes over and asks that person. So tell me about that pot. What is it that attracted you to that particular pot? And so it's, you're right. Everybody's got some individual reactions to each of the pieces, don't they? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's hopefully forever. That's art. That's yeah. like, hopefully we're all like getting things because of what they're meaning to us and not because they're something we think we're supposed to like, but it is funny how we play games. Like when people, oh, I think we all do it, but I'll have like my absolute favorite pot. And then when somebody buys it, I'll be like, that was my favorite pot. And people think I'm just saying that. And I'm like, <laughs> no, it really was. And then I'll pick the next favorite. And I always like, I always have to have like my favorite. I don't know why, but I'll be yeah. like, that's the one. And then someone will get it and then it'll go to another one. But pretty yeah, funny. That's, that's great. Hey, can you tell us a little bit about your book, Hand Built? Oh, sure. That So at this point, I think that book is five years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that was a surprise. I got an email of somebody asking me if I would be interested in writing a book on hand building. And I, my initial reaction was to say no, because I was like, I don't know how to write a book. Um, but I asked my friend who's really smart that I've known almost my whole life. I was like, I got this email. What should I say? And she, she's like, you, you say yes. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I was like, oh, so it's, it's because of her. I said yes. And I was really glad I did it. It was an interesting process. It's really interesting to, to, to try and teach people a visual thing that you're used to showing them, but just in words. I mean, obviously there's pictures in the book, but I had to explain everything without showing them which was tricky but it was good timing i had had carpal tunnel surgery and so i couldn't work so i had something to do during that time which was nice and yeah it, it's you know the it's kind of hard when you write a book i think about what you're making because five years later like the work is so different and even some of the way i'm making is so different that the book to me feels irrelevant and very dated at this point but i know that like other people don't think so so it's kind of interesting because when i look at the book now i'm like ah i don't even make pots like that anymore or <laughs> <laughs> i i do all these different decorations now but i guess it's it's it, hopefully it's still bringing some good a good resource to yeah, people. i get feedback that it is so that's nice Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, when people pick it up and it's exciting for them, that's at their point in their journey. Um, and you're exactly you've, you've moved on. Is there another book coming on the horizon? I don't have one. Um, I, I mean, I did like that process, but I don't know if it's something that I'm like seeking out to to do again. I mean, if the opportunity happened and it seemed right, I would be open to it, but I don't think I'm actively trying. Uh, do you teach in your studio? Um, so before the pandemic, I would teach workshops in here occasionally. And then I started doing so many shows and was really busy or I mean, way before the pandemic and stopped. And then the pandemic happened. And then this, I just did list a week long workshop in June in my studio and a couple shorter workshops, like Saturday workshops. And I'm excited to start doing that again because um, I like teaching and I, I've been doing less shows and more and more making pots and putting them online to sell. So I end up getting pretty isolated in my world. And I love making art communally and with other people and talking about things and so that's like my favorite part of teaching is just the relationships and how deep they get when you're spending seven to ten hours a day making work with people and it's always like 
people from different walks of life. So I'm really excited about teaching again in here and just like having the experience of making work with people and making those connections. Mm, it's beautiful. Do you have any yeah. advice for, uh, um, I always want to say a young ceramic artist, but maybe I should say uh, somebody new to the field. Have you got some advice for somebody who's who's entering into this work and what they could do to help uh, get them to where they want to be? Wow. I always feel like that question is so hard to answer in a lot of ways. One way being that everybody is so different. Mm -hmm. And I think that like any advice I would offer might have been helpful for me, but who I think people really need to trust themselves and like figure things out on their own and just really trust themselves and like go for it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I think people come, come to it with like a, maybe a little bit too much fear of things not working out. And I think that really inhibits people's creative process where if you were making things without any expectations, I think the work would just, you would find yourself in the work a lot easier, but that's hard for people to do, especially if they're entering this, like with a financial expectation. I think mm -hmm. that was one of the luckiest things for me is I started with, I didn't know it was going to be a career. I didn't necessarily even think about it like that. I, I had a job, so I was just making ceramics for the pure joy of it. Um, and that I think was a lot of the reason why I didn't have a lot of fear and was experimenting so much because none, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. But I think, I mean, advice wise is, I think maybe that maybe just like, don't give into the fear of like the bad things that can happen because art shouldn't be like that. It It's a bummer that we monetize it at all. Mm. We have to, but just trying to like, trying to keep that like experimental spirit and not so focused on like bad things happening or what could go wrong or not being in quotes successful, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know what you mean. Or or feeling like you're being judged by people. Uh, th those things really inhibit us from uh, being able to be creative. Uh, absolutely. Yes. You know, I've heard you also today talk about when you started off first, you asked a lot of questions. And that meant you had people to ask questions too. And so my guess is that that would be another thing that aside from the experimenting and doing things of, out of a sense of joy, is to have people around you that you can uh, have conversations with about your work. Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't even only have to be like in ceramics. Like, I think putting ourselves in these separate worlds of what medium we're using mm -hmm. maybe isn't so helpful. Like, I spend a lot of time now looking at things that aren't ceramics, and it's a lot more helpful in my creative process and like hanging out with painters and talking to painters and looking at paintings and um, different art forms than just ceramics. Cause I think mm -hmm. we can get very myopic in what we do. And it, it, it's, it's, I think important to see ceramics in the context of art and other mediums, yeah. Yeah. but I am taking on my first apprentice. I've never had one before. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. It's a younger person and they're, very excited and earnest and I think it'll be really nice to have somebody in here and work with somebody a couple of days a week and yeah good for both of us I think yeah absolutely uh, being a mentor is good for both the mentee and the mentor yes absolutely I think you'll have a great time with it yeah and I'm I'm looking forward to it yeah. Hey, Melissa, thanks very much for the conversation here today. I 
really appreciate you spending some time with us. Is there anything that you think we missed talking about with respect to color and surface that you'd like to share? Um, well, I think artists have an important role in our world, in our culture, in our society to speak the truth. And I think that is getting hard or has been hard for people, but I think you always need to be speaking your truth and never worry about, a, I, I just think people just shouldn't be maybe intimidated or scared to let their art speak truth because it is important and it matters. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Color and Ceramics podcast with Bob Acton and his guests. Please help others find the podcast by subscribing to this podcast wherever you find your podcasts, such as iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube, or other podcatchers. And don't forget to give us a review. We'll see you next time.